What is up? Welcome to the in-person version of the Van Flip podcast, presented by Liam Goat, obviously. We're on location today at the Orange Peel in Asheville, North Carolina. It's my second time being here. It's a wonderful venue. I've always thought about coming back, and luckily I am able to be back, and I am joined by JB and Sebastian of the band Baroness. Welcome to the show, guys. How are you doing? Good. Doing great. It's awesome, awesome. You guys are uh, third day of tour, the Oblivion, Sweet Oblivion tour, celebrating the release of your new album, Stone. Also, 20 years of the band. Congratulations. Oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's 10 years for me. I know, it's 10 for you. Still, yeah, yeah, 20 good. for the but whole year. There's though. two anniversaries happening, and we're not... We're not really celebrating. I yet. know. I didn't need, know if I, I should bring that up. Somebody told me. So, somebody <laughs> mentioned to me the, the other night. They were like, "So, what are you guys doing for?" And I was like, oh, "This tour." I, I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> this tour. Um, and I should probably preface this again. This is the first in-person podcast. So, if you're listening, these microphones may not be all balanced and whatnot. But hey, what else is new with the Lamgo Podcast, right, guys? Mm, not sure. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, these microphones <laughs> seem fantastic. Okay. So, Stone just got. Uh, you just released Stone. My first question is. About the album title, is it a color, or did you guys just go away from the colors after Golden Gold? I mean, you kind of answered your own question. Yeah. Which part, first or second? Of my is, is it a color? Is, is it, it a color? color? Is it a color? Is it a color? Technically? Technically, I don't think it is a color. I don't think so, but I'm sure there's a crayon or pencil that's or paint somewhere. Yeah, that's what I was going there's got, to, there's got to be a Crayola. There's a shade has, somewhere. Well, there was stone. Slate, I think. Slate, is definitely one of them. Classic. So why the... Why the direction away from the colors? Are we going to physical objects now of hardness? Uh, well, it's, as far as why do we change? <laughs> mm. Maybe not of hardness. <laughs> <laughs> firmness? We'll see. We'll yeah, see. We'll see how mm, firm okay. it is. Um, no, uh, well, the, the, the concept for the chromatic themed titles only had six iterations. Uh, it was meant to be. It was meant to build a rainbow of album titles. So we got a bit cheeky with you know some of the titles, but essentially it was supposed to just be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Mm. So you know, golden gray was our orange. Can I ask you a question? Yes, as go a, ahead. As a, the new band member of ten years. Were you ever tempted to do like the? The, the basic colors, uh, it's either TV or printing. They're, it's magenta, Oh, RGB it's or cyan. CMYK. Yeah. Was that ever a temptation to use that version of the colors? No, but maybe we shouldn't be talking about it now because that could be a temptation oh, in the just, future. Uh, right. let out something. <laughs> so what yeah, because it could be cyan, magenta, what, what? yellow. Yellow, so yellow is used both. You in, already did that one. And uh, K, which is black. What we about uh, oh. K? What does the K mean? I have no idea. And I That's a good question. I should know is that. Is that for screens or for printing? That is for uh, printed 2D materials. RGB is RGB are the three colors That's that you use pixels. when you're transmitting light. Yeah, yeah. Uh, CMYK right, right. is what it takes. It takes four colors the to pigments. build uh, a full range of colors in printing. Right. And what was the idea behind using the, the rainbow at, at the beginning, 20 years ago? I mean, at the very beginning, it was just sort of a, sort of a, almost like a casual joke. Mm. Uh, I do, I, and I remember, I remember the moment that it happened, like very, very clearly. We were, we had, uh, we were writing our record red, uh, and we made that record in the basement of the of the Jinx, which was the uh, like the club in Savannah, the mm -hmm. sort of a punk club, like heavy music mecca uh, during during the years that I was there, between Early 2000 and 2010. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And our drummer Alan at the time. W and I were talking about you know what, what we would title the record because we were it was in its nascent form at that point, and he said that it, he, he was like well, wouldn't it be cool if we just did a rainbow? He's like you're obviously going to design all the all the jackets and like think how awesome our merch spread would look, right? When we got all six of those records out, it, the, the implicit thing there being was like there's no fucking way that we're ever going to record six records. We just you know, <laughs> right. I think I I don't, I don't think. I think we. I think I took the band very seriously, and I was like, "Yes, we could do six records." But I believe the overwhelming theme was yeah, like, "We'll never get there, but let's see how far cool. we get." And you know, lo and behold, by 2019, we had we had completed that cycle. Uh, so I think that f moving from those albums to this new album, uh, we needed we internally needed to feel the need for that ch for a change. 
which was present, I think, even from the from the very beginnings of Stone. Uh, but this, the, you know, there, there were there were some sort of signifiers that, that made it easier easier for me to move away from doing the color titles because I think that was very I think it was a really fun thing, you know, series of, of records for me to work with as an artist. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, this is this is literally our first record with a stable lineup, and that might sound just like like one funny little data point. But I think that it, I think actually that when it came to writing, the the chemist you know the chemistry that you accrue uh, with with a band touring for years and years and years is something that I always dreamt about building on. But when you've got somebody new coming in, you always you always have to keep one foot in right. the past, so that that n so that the new the newest member doesn't feel like they're the one that's changing things inexorably. <laughs> yeah, like like when I when I joined on Purple, I intentionally tried to do things that I thought Alan did or were or Alan, were, were, were Al right. Alanisms. Oh, gotcha. I didn't want to come in and be like, "This is what it sounds like." You guys are asking my own my questions. For yeah, me. so that's so good. you know when we got to when we got to Golden Gray, uh, Nick and Sebastian felt well, we 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 all felt that it was time for them to be a little bit m more a hundred percent of what you know who they are as musicians because you know as as you as is audible through those records I think the current baronet's uh, rhythm section is has got a real identity that's in some ways kind of separate from the identity of the guitar players and singers in the band whereas in the past it was it was a more condensed sort of thing yeah you know I think w what we've done is we've gotten older and we've seen the value in maybe letting a rhythm, you know, like having music where the rhythm section fulfills that sort of classic role mm. uh, that's, that is somewhat independent from the guitar riffs. You know, it's cool when everybody's the same thing. It's cool when everybody's like on that same page, but I think it's, I think the music gets a little bit more dimension when you let, yeah. when, you, when you stop, I mean, and I think the thing that happened with Stone, which was, you know, building on this chemistry and signifying this, cha this sort of sea change and the way that we approach things, was that there wasn't a ton of discussion, like verbal discussion amongst us about what chords are you playing, what key is the song in, what you know, let's let's organize these leads, let's let's coordinate all this stuff. We know each other, we trust each other. We don't need to do that as much anymore. Golden Gray involved a lot of debate in the studio, yeah, and yeah. a lot of everybody trying to you know make their case, or whatever. We that on Stone. It, it was a lot less. There were a lot less of that. Interesting, yeah. Because I was curious as to, you know, because again, members do come and go, and uh, one of the questions I was going to ask much later, I guess, but we're in the vein, here we are. We're we're in the vein of what that Wherever topic is. So, my question here was, when Sebastian did come in, like, how, and then when Gina came in too, like, how are the trajectories of the band, you know, sonically? How did that change? And you know, how was that as a as a band to take on? But clearly, it's it kind of just said that. The newcomers kind of tried to meld to the sound of the band to, to, the, to, to, to an the band. to an extent. Like, right, right, right. Like and it's then, it's really important to me that that I, I think the band is the power of Baroness that, that we've built on is that it the members of the group are free to express themselves in, in their way. Yeah. But uh, so I, I guess a better way to put it is the process of making a record is is kind of a learning experience for. At the time, you know, newer members like Sebastian and Nick, like right. Varnas is sort of a weird blend of, like, really technical, really embellished, really like organized, composed music, but also, it requires a certain type of loose, sort of rough swagger, you know, yeah. which is just because I'm kind of a rough player at times. Um, so I John think John and I are basically self-taught, and and Nick and Gina are more studied. Yeah. And I think it, I think it makes trained, it, yes. Well, yeah, but I think it but, makes but it's a cool combo. No, no, yeah. And we and I found I found that we we sort of like I think because we we're very we, we like to analyze things and we like to critique things uh, in real time. But I th I think one one thing that's always existed in this band is these sort of fragmented dualities that that we'll have like for, for instance like this thing like Seb and I essentially come from like punk backgrounds. Right, okay. You know, you just. You figure it out as you're doing it. You you know, you just like <laughs> do whatever do you do whatever you want, no whatever questions asked. Good. But you got to figure it out as you go as you go along. And then uh, Nick and Gina, as he, as he mentioned, both had formal training mm -hmm. and more, you know, maybe a maybe a deeper. I mean, Seb has it too, but maybe a deeper knowledge of theory and composition. Right. 
uh, as a result of study, w whereas I've sort of picked that up along the way from them, which mm. is, you know, kind of a wonderful thing. So seven are kind of like the loose, scrappy, like we're always playing 110% of our capability. And Nick and Gina have... challenge yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. Nick and Gina, the, the, the sort of technical stuff comes more fluidly to them. Mm. I mean, much more fluidly to them at times. But then they have to sort of meet in the middle. And, you know, I remember when Gina joined, there was, we just sort of had to go over like... Or we sort of, I sort of had to say, like, look, we can practice these songs, you and I, all the time, but once the band gets here, it's going to be different. And then once we get on stage, it's going to be entirely different. So you need to learn how to, like, really, like, play the guitar incorrectly, like, uh, like too hard sometimes. Was that difficult for her to, like, to take on? I don't know that it was difficult. It's just, it's just a jarring thing right. when you've, you know, in, in some ways when you've spent your, your, you know, young life as a musician practicing those subtle things and learning how to do the the real sophisticated dynamic controlled things it's some i think you can i think you can teach yourself so much control that you forget how to let go of it you know yeah. and i'm not saying that, that that was the case with either of them but we did we did sort of have to you know it is a it's a matter of meeting in the middle and then like i said so you know that that's the seb and i and gina and nick and then gina and i you know, uh, we have a musical sensibility that's that's very much in line, whereas Nick and Seb have you know sort of a different uh, musical thing. So you know, we got rhythm section. We we're, just like, yeah, we're just like arguing about music terms. <laughs> that's what Nick and I do. It's yeah, everybody else loves it. Yeah, yeah, the the technical term and just whatever you guys call it, whatever you call it back in the day, kind of thing. It just goes, it just goes on and on. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like it's never ending. What is what is swing? What a swing! Yeah, what what does swing mean? To it's me, like, uh, in a digital audio workstation it's just you know the, the off like when something is programmed you know it's like ding 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 robotic yeah but this you put more swing on it it makes it seem more human like and see more natural. that's yeah. that's more what i know a thing was saying yeah i was saying that for drummers the the the, the assumption is somebody says play it with swing they mean play the first and third triplets <laughs> on the beat. yeah 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 the swing music type style it, well no that's swing music and with swing is different ah and also, it swings is not, it is swung. We're I'm totally true. It's, no, no, he's, he's very, like, totally like these, these are. It swings means it sounds good. It sounds yeah. human. It's, right, it's right. really it's swinging. Yeah, I mean, it means like it's it got a good swung pocket. It means it's approaching the triplet feel. I got you. Okay. That is, a, I learned that today. <laughs> I'm sure somebody, Well, if you want to learn a please, whole lot more about it, like disagree, let them go. Please disagree yeah. with me and let's okay. keep this going. This Maybe we'll do it after the show, we'll just do some <laughs> bonus content of you guys arguing about terms, and that'll be a whole other segment. Um, we, you'll have to turn the mics down because we get loud. <laughs> that, was, that was the least punk rock discussion. We ever yes. I'm sorry anyway, about that. But, but, but see, I, I do think it's kind of like to, to the point where like we, we approach the music we play in, the, in a similar fashion to the way that I approached, you know, more punk stylings that I had when I was younger but we're trying to do like very sophisticated very uh, interesting you know sort of progressive ways of playing music or just just unique ways of playing music but we still got to have that you know as much of that edge as possible right. or we or we need to maintain that edge and not not lose it in favor of sophistication and gotcha. smoothness and you know I think I think there's you know, you know for the listener who wants really really precise really really technical really really advanced playing there's a there's a whole world of music out there that's just like dizzying right. Right. and horrible and not musical so for us it's always, it's always we, we we use the term musical a lot because i think you can i think you can do things that are you know technically dazzling but not musical and uh you know whereas you you know if you listen to like more folk based musics from around the world it's simple but there's like feeling to it so we, yeah. we try we're try, always trying to find that center ground where all those all those worlds sort of meet interesting and you guys just said you kind of are more self-taught like how long how long have you like when did you start playing the drums or a guitar Cause uh, i know on like the first mini records John, you didn't play guitar at all. So the first what? The first rec the first few records. Did you not play guitar? No, I always play guitar. Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was wrong then. We're a guitar band. Yeah, yeah. No, I figured that, but I thought it was very strange <laughs> that I've I, never, I've I never sang why. in a band yeah. in my life. I've never just been a singer in the band in my life. I kind of, I fantasize about it sometimes, like holding a mic if, and I mean, like being able to you move around. Do it in our, there's a couple of songs where no, you have to be. Dude, you know, you have to be. I never get, I never get twenty seconds to just chill. <laughs> I don't. What about the V for Rose? 
maybe uh, maybe ten seconds here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Sorry, they're texting me outside, so I'm trying to reiterate back here. Um. So where where's the trajectory after Stone going to head for the band? Even though I know we got we just put a record out and technically. You guys like to spend, a, you know, three to four years before you release a record, but well, we don't know, like we don't to like do that. To. <laughs> <laughs> something always happens. So, yeah, well, something something been, always happens. That's been the release cycle for the most part. Well, I'll I'll say that. So you're saying we, a newer this, record? Before? We haven't like okay. So here we are, th night three of a tour in support of a record which just came out. This hasn't happened to us before. Mm. Not since I joined the band. Yeah. Have you done okay. it? I mean, you've got it. No, you uh, got, yellow and I green think got screwed up. Obviously, yellow and green we got screwed up. Yeah, because blue. Like, what did you do? A normal tour cycle? We must have. We must have. But you know, it's been since blue, which is, I guess, fourteen years old or something. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's some the <laughs> online tells me that. Um, I don't celebrate birthdays like that. I know we're twentieth birthday up in here. And no one knew about it. But yeah, w w with blue, in between blue and yellow and green, our you know, bass player of, uh, you know, who, yeah. who was there at the beginning, like he left the band just before we recorded Yellow and Green. So when, even when we went out at the beginning, before our, the accident in 2012, we were, um, we had, we had just like had a friend of ours filling in on bass. So that was all, we were starting from sort of a weird place anyway, right. but then August 15 and we fall off a cliff and da, 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 da. So that record cycle was done. Mm -hmm. And then when Purple came out, there was just, you know, we, we did some like setup tours in the U.S., but we never really, we never really did the normal thing. We did like a small, like, like small club, like two week yeah. tour, you know. It, 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 to like, to like get us ready to do, you know, a full headline tour. And then, you know, then P Pete left the band uh, through that cycle. And so we were, again, we were sort of in... Uh, a limbo. Yeah, in, in that sort of limbo. And then when Gina joined, we did Golden Grey and... Uh, we were ready to tour on Golden Gray, but then the lockdown happened. So awesome! Yeah, then we, you know, now we get into Stone. So, so I uh, already we've already done better with this record than any of our past records, and that we're just out supporting it. Which yeah, we already had our gear freighted to Australia and our guitar tech in New Zealand. <laughs> That's how close we were. Nice in twenty in 2020. Being on oh, that wow. tour. Yeah, wow. Yeah, we were we were four days away from flying yeah. when the lockdown happened, and. Stupidly, we thought we were still flying. You know, like up until be, up until week. the lockdown, we, we thought we were going. Next week will be all right. Well, everything will be normal. So, uh, I, I hate talking about it, but like, how good or bad was the pando for the band? It was tremendously bad, as bad as you can possibly imagine. Just like it was like for everybody else. Financially, or just oh, I mean, it's bad. obviously, yeah. Too, I mean, we're mentally too, or we yeah, mentally, physically. I mean, the whole, the whole it was also it was also it was really dark for me. I had other things going on that I'm not going to talk about. But it was to. also it was really good for me. I really fell in love with the drums again and with practicing. I live in Brooklyn and my rehearsal space is two blocks from my apartment there and I live go. alone. And I would just go by myself every day. I had nothing else to do. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like and I know just, it's bad. And you know, know what? Like I had bad. it was actually fun. I had yeah. a good time and it I, and I learned a lot from the, from the, from that time. Yeah. You know? and, and some people did take that time to, you know. Yeah. They enjoyed it. So that's why I asked. Although bands and this industry in general definitely suffered. Of course. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was, it, was, it was hard. I, I think for, I think we occupy like sort of a lower middle class level of band. You, right, meaning, right, right. meaning we got to go to work every day. Right, 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 right. We have to go to work every day. And we committed ourselves to that years we're ago. We're not successful enough to not have to do this. And we're not, and we're successful enough that we depend on it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like you, that, you don't have to ne necessarily valley. have a second job. Yeah. Right. I mean, didn't want it's, to. It's a, we're, 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 you know, kind of a blue collar band in that way we, where when we work, things go decently for us. And if we stop working for a few years, <laughs> it gets, you know, right. it, the, the shoestrings get tighter and tighter. And, and, um, you know, I think that, that, that was a really, that was a really difficult challenge to overcome because I have a, fairly specific vision for what this band is and it's not it's not that it's not something I can articulate and define on paper but it's got to be a certain way or else it's not we don't release it right. you know it has to meet a, a certain thresholds and standards of uh, of quality and sincerity and if it doesn't then no good so you know having the rug pulled out from underneath us when we we're super excited to tour on a record that did that did its own thing, but then you know, then I think the thing that w maybe 
was the only light in that era, that time period for me because I had a lot of like horrible things going on personally. I just you know I wasn't I wasn't there was a worst time in the world for me to just stop uh, and just do and nothing. just doing it. Yeah, no, yeah. it was it was genuinely like very very difficult. But we came, you know, we had the idea that, well, it seems like we've got a little bit of time ahead of us, so let's let's do a new record, and there's no better time than now to just take that further step into, you know, artistic and creative independence and make the record ourselves, mm -hmm. not rely on anybody else. Let's just see what the four of us can do with only our you know only the bounds of our creativity and only the bounds of our imagination to restrict us hmm. we had we you know i've been craigslisting and ebaying equipment since the early 2000s and I essentially built a like a functional studio worth of stuff nice. so we rented an airbnb in the middle of nowhere uh in the middle of the pandemic <laughs> we didn't even have tape off it was just literally the four of us Oh wow! Yeah, so so no, like we, we, we engineered, we set up mics. Interesting. We nice. we were writing, we were composing, we were rehearsing, we were wiring things together, and in between takes, I would have to run <laughs> back and forth between the the like the console, right? Uh, which was in A the master bedroom. Yeah, the control room was in the master bedroom, and the main the you know the sort of living room dining room area was like the the drum room. And how much does the ambience of that? It was, play huge, into it was a huge thing. It was a huge thing. I mean, Nick and I went around looking at houses, and I walked into that house, and I clapped a couple of times, and I'm like, "We could get this place." Nice. Like I, I knew it was like drums are going to sound good. Tonight. Yeah, it was. It was, and it, and it, and genuinely, I think it was kind of the perfect place. I would 100 percent do our next record there again. Are you? No. That's what I was going to ask too. Is that like going to be the next? Is that what the band will do? For records going forward, just I don't see why we wouldn't because the, the experience itself was was quite rewarding, it's and I cash too, I, right? I maybe think this time we take a, a friend to help us. Set yeah, up we would, <laughs> it would it would be <laughs> nice to have, it would yeah. be nice to have an like, like somebody to like for assist sure. an engineer uh, for certain. But I think that it for you know the interesting thing was that in that time period, it forced us to utilize our utilize our chemistry it forced us to like really really genuinely trust each other uh and to sh to show the kind of musical respect to, to you know to each of our bandmates that you know that i kind of only always dreamed about having mm -hmm. you know uh where we are we are our own quality control we are in charge of capturing the sounds the you know the quality and the nature of those sounds uh we were in charge of composing and and we what i think what what we learned maybe a bit uh through 2019 um and certainly through some of the tours that we did like just you know in 2021 2022 we did these your baroness tours were just like an evening with we had to know every song from our back catalog we were playing mm -hmm. three hour sets every night and so we, I missed that. I really am it was it was <laughs> yeah. fucking it was, it was awesome. It was like was it taxing? It must have been taxing though. It was taxing, but it was I, I liked it. I, it was like very. It felt athletic. Cool. You know, Nick and I had so John and Gina would do like two or three acoustic songs in the middle of the set, so Nick and I could go backstage, which is you know whatever wink, wink. the broom Bathroom. closet or whatever, yeah. you know, <laughs> and just have a couple of beers, you know, and it was like it was like it was yeah, it was fun. Nice. I, I mean, didn't mean to throw you off on no no on no, that. but but you know like if you can imagine what it takes to be flexible enough to because because the we do we did three sets the a set was like the ticket buyers in that town would get a list of at literally every song we rec we've ever recorded including the working titles from the songs that would be on stone mm. so i don't know what we would have done if they had called those yeah, out but we just yeah. it, it was kind of a it, we were just being cheeky because we knew they wouldn't get votes um but like, you know so we this? had to, so we had to be able to play kind of anything and then, you know, like Gene and I would do a couple acoustic songs for, you know, 20 minutes. And then we'd come out and we'd sort of jam. We would, we, we took the, the song Can Oscura from Golden Grey and we just turned that into a sort of freeform jam, mm. which would set off the final uh, part of the set, which was just kind of anything we wanted to do. Because we had learned and prepared all the songs, we felt like, well, we'll just stick all, we'll stick them all in the back half of the set and we'll be good at them. And so we were able to play, I think it was like four or five songs every night off of every record that we've done, mm. uh, which was really challenging and super fun. Oh, and I kept bet. us in, in really good shape. 
but I think it taught us how to it taught us how to be intuitive and reactive as as players mm -hmm. as co-musicians and so when you know w when we were doing stone a lot of it felt like it was more improvisational uh, and we never really we never really over composed the songs to the point where there had to, there was only one way to do it you know there would, when do there you when do you know that it's done? When do you know that a Baroness song is done and how long does it take to get well, to that point? it depends if you talking about the instruments or the vocals. <laughs> uh, the the, the finished product, the finished product of the song. Well, the yeah. finished product, the finished product, I mean, it, it, it's, it is interesting. This record, it's not the best way to write music by far, but we wrote all the instrument, um, instrumentals first. Okay. Did you have lyrics in mind or you wrote that to the song? I had lyrics, but they didn't work. And then I spent about a year and a half mm. in, like, with writer's block because... There was no, exp I, w I had no experience. I wasn't out in the I world. I was like, am I still in Baroness? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> no, no one's texted me in a while. No one's texting me. What's happening? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, we, after we had the instrumental versions of these songs, Gina and I worked for a while at, at uh, our home studio uh, in my basement, in my art studio, to doing, tracking guitars and starting to work on vocals. But the vocals thing was, it was very difficult to come by and, mm, I figured out what it was way too late, but we had gone out in the spring of 2021 to do the first Your Baroness tour, and the vocals weren't done. They were barely even started at that point. And, and I came back from that tour and then the following tour uh, in the, or no, the fall, it was fall 2021, spring of 2022. At the end of spring of 2022, I'd been out in the world. I'd been mm -hmm. playing music. I'd had experience. Right. I'd, I'd had, I had things to draw on uh, to help the music have life and then the then the vocals and lyrics came easily you know what else i think uh i think you rediscovered some earlier vocal styles when we did the yeah the, um, yeah because there are some sure. there, are, sure some there are some new vocal styles on the new styles, on the new yeah, album for sure and the when, new the new vocal styles <laughs> it's funny how i got everybody's really like it's funny how i got there because well a i, I just want to point out that I'm thinking the we've, rose. Is we've done quite a bit of spoken vocals on former records. I haven't done them as confidently or as prominently right, as okay. I do on this record. But it's not. You it's not a. Everybody? It's not a new thing. Yeah. Uh, but I you, liked it. I, I will. I will say uh, when when Ro, the rose single came out, I was like, yeah, that's. I like that one. And you know, people who are fans of yours that have been fans for a long period of time, uh, and. Admittedly, I'm only in the last 10 years, so you know, yeah. I'm not an earlier on uh, fan. But you know, I definitely enjoyed that track and the chorus, too. Yeah. And it all pairs you know, magically well together, and I'm looking forward to hearing it live tonight. But uh, it, I think it was one of the you know, things that not divided the fans, but definitely they had p opinions about it. It's that. funny. I, I never thought it was such like a big deal. You know? I don't yeah. know. Well, that's but th again, that's the beauty of the being drummer, in the, so, that's the know. beauty of being in that <laughs> bubble that we were in. I know, and we we just kind of were like, well, this is good. You know, this feels right. This feels genuine. It it, it moves me. So well, I mean, also when, when when we were writing, working on that song, we definitely realized that there are some elements of that song that have a sort of like early '90s like mm -hmm. sort of you know like maybe Jesus Lizard or something yeah. kind of influence in there yeah Jesus Lizard Leonard Leonard Cohen Nick Cave like those, those are all huge huge influences on me as a, as a lyricist and as a vocalist and you know the, the texture of speaking or loudly talking you know it's sort of pitched talking or whatever but that the, the mood and flavor of that was something that was the, was easy for me to emote with. And the funny thing was, I think I discovered that when we were out on that Lamb of God tour. We were out with Lamb of God, Suicide Silence, yep. and Kill Switch Engage. That was, that was a crazy tour. we finished that album. I did Rose wow. the day, the day, oh, like two about, days about after we that. got back from that tour. Oh, really? Because, because when we were on the tour, I was, you know, I was like, man, I got to figure out what to do with my mic sets because I don't, I, I, you know, I, I had, uh, honestly, and I, I'm, I feel sh slightly ashamed about this, but... I think I had assumed that the Lamb of God, Suicide Silence, Kill Switch crowd wasn't really going to like pick up on what we were putting down. I, I don't think that was too. the case no, no, in no, reality, wasn't. which is which is awesome. Right, it was fun uh, because it was you know, it was surprising. It was a surprising lineup for me. Right, and you know, that but was crazy. I early in that tour, I just I was like, well, 
I can't do my my normal like low talking, just you know the sort of like stream of consciousness bullshit that mm-hmm. I do normally. And so I kind of got into this like WWE character that just you know you just talk everything like with force and conviction. Yeah. And we were like halfway through the tour, and I was like, "This is I'm like this this is like a natural this, this voice. This feels for me. this feels yeah, right. Feel, this feels right." <laughs> So I, you know, I remember we, we got back from we got back from the tour, and I had this huge set of like verses written out, uh, which became the choir, um, and I had I had act- I actually had nothing for for Rose, uh, but I had just read the uh, this George Eliot poem that was that had a huge impact on me. George Eliot, the mm-hmm. Victorian uh, English poet. Um, and so for some reason this, this poem was like kind of knocking around in my head and I, and something I've worked out up about something I was like in a really, really awful mood, just like furious. And I had no way to, uh, exercise that fury. So I went down, it's like two in the morning. I went down to the basement and Rose is kind of the first two things, the first two takes that I did from it. I had no lyrics. I just kind of spit them out. Oh, really? And tightened up the lyrics, did it a second time, and I didn't change it because I, like, I thought the oh, only thing I'm going to do is make this sound lamer and lamer if I if I understand it more. Overpick it, nitpick it. Yeah. So so, and again and again, like, you have to remember the music was written a year and a half before that, mm-hmm. and the music was written with a pretty free and open mind, so I had to stick my I had to hold myself to the standard of that spirit, a year and a half later when I'm doing the vocals, which is like three takes mm. whatever whatever is best and so nine times out of ten is the first take yeah it's like little wayne just stepping into the booth with nothing yeah so down, there's right? like you know there's like little pitch discrepancies and the timing is crazy in some of the songs but it was just you know that you, sometimes you you have you know as, as any producer will tell you the first thing that a vocalist does has the nervous anticipatory energy and there's some of that like unsure footing actually helps the you know the soul of a of a voice like mm-hmm. find its place on a record so you know i was i was trying i was trying to hold myself to that standard with with the vocals and vocals are definitely something that if it's too smooth too well done that can be a put off yeah for and me. you guys debate on that and no i okay. think i think we all agree on that no we that, that's just something or we, like when, we, when it happens you bring it up it's, it's, John, it's, more, it's more when we're listening to other music. Ah, okay. Like, this yeah. singer's kind of too good. This sucks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's it's like, doing. Yeah, like, the, the recent example for us was we were watching um, the, what was it, 83? Us, the Us Festival. The Us Festival in California in 83. So they had, the, like, the New Wave Day, the Heavy mm-hmm. Metal Day, and the Rock Day. And we were, you know, the, the Van Halen footage from that, it's like, the, it's like famous drunken David Lee Roth. Yeah. Uh, footage that er, that I think most people uh, or Van, Van Halen fans at least are, are aware of this footage. It's great, right? right. And they're, they're like so they're so good. It's like you know, it, they do have a little bit of rock and roll energy for, oh, for sure. I mean, they got a ton. Dude, it's like but so much rock and roll energy. energy. But, we, <laughs> but we watched that and we're like, this rules, this rules, this rules, this rules. And then the next night we queued up the new the new wave day and. I think it kind of reached its pinnacle when we watched the full Clash set that they, you know, they were the headliners that night. And it's so good. It's so jagged and raw. And and it's tight in that sort of way. I don't know the way the Clash works. Yeah, it's like a punk loose way. Yeah, in a punk yeah. loose way. But, the, but the, the groove is solid. The songs are good. And the urgency and the insistence is, is there. And that's something that I've always been drawn to Mm -hmm. so you know i think there's countless examples for us we we just sort of prove it time and time again that you know the more spirited take is the better one the more spirited loose you know not perfect not it it's it's not even that it's not perfect because i think that actually is perfect right it's not i think i think i I think imperfection is homogeny yeah i mean i feel like that's kind of a problem particularly with metal too polished. It's too polished nowadays. It's just like a, a lot of it sounds like it's literally just programmed. Production wise, or yeah. just in general overall. I think it, I think overall. Okay. Yeah, I think overall. So I, I mean, do like the production side of it sounding better and not sounding like it's recorded. A- in absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. But you. But like you can't 
produce a metal record like a pop record and play a metal record like a pop record without right. it sounding like a pop record. Right. You know, and they're doing that out there. Not I mean, you guys, but they are doing I'm it out there. I'm down with people, you know, mixing and matching different attitudes. That's fine. But I just like, I hear a lot of newer, even the last 10 years, it's just, everything's so slick. Mm-hmm. And so, it just sounds, yeah, it's, it sounds unhuman. However, I do think that in 2023, we in 2022, we saw a rebirth in in younger generations music of a rediscovery of attitude. Oh yeah. And I think that was something that for me has been missing for a very long time from I underground agree music with you. is I agree with is you. like look, technique is fine, but technique is a tool. Mhm. Technique is a tool by which you express yourself. Of course, you need a reason. You need yeah, a reason you need a reason it. to do it. I think what happens is, well, I think what happened, and I've said this before on the podcast, is somewhere around the 2010s, you started seeing record labels finding out they could cash in on this kind of heavier music, and you could see it on like MTV and all these other outlets, and then you had bands just making albums or songs to do just that. You know, to just sure. get paid or something like that. You got and a lot of these, like, like, like a lot of the sort of Southern California. In general, yeah. Yeah, like, and it, it's, I, you know, it's like festival metal. Right. Like, and that's, great, and that, great costumes, guys. <laughs> but I don't see, I don't see a real amp on stage. I hate that. I don't, I don't hear four people playing. I hear four people playing and then a thousand backing tracks. Yeah. And I, Reject! I reject that. You know, That's not fucking music. You know, you know, you, you you know when you see it, I reject it. No, I, I agree. I don't, side I don't like stage, it that much. Right? You're like, oh, this is awesome. A lot of bands nowadays at festivals, you watch side stage. Can hear them. All you hear is cymbals. And I've done the that drums, recently, and it's not good. The drums are, are tr- triggers, whatever. It's fine, I guess. But it's not. Everybody has in ears. There's nothing. There's and there's all the amps are modeled, mm-hmm. modelers, whatever. There's like nothing on stage. Yeah, I've even seen shows where they don't even set up amps at all. And exactly. just play direct in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. I mean, like, at least fool me. Maybe that's, I don't know, but maybe I, we're stupid and we well, should start doing that. No, but, <laughs> but, but I think, they're paying the ass. I think, it's, a, I think it's, I think it's one of these instances where, like, if you're aware of what you are, if you use the technology in an interesting way, then I'm all about it, Meshuggah. Right, right, right. Like, I don't want to hear Meshuggah play through, through like, Marshall full stacks. I want them to sound just like they do it's because it's to sound because they've weird. taken yeah, yeah, they've yeah. taken the technology to a to an extreme place. They pushed it. They're yeah, and I think and I think that I think that you know I don't want to do the tirade thing, and I'm not going to name names or anything. But when I'm talking about festival metal, you know who you I, are. I think I think that there's the 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 sort of outward sheen of extreme music, but the inner core <clears throat> is garbage pop Mm -hmm. i love pop music but it's got to be good you know that shit it just drives me up the wall because i mean partially because i'm jealous because it's so financially successful these people are making money hand over fist but they're fooling people they're and they're fools they're fooling it's a foolish fan base i'm not the sort of person who says i want one fan base or another I want genuine music to be successful, not mine, everyone else's. I want true, genuine, incredible music to be held as, as, the, as the, the ultimate commodity. Again, like th- if you think about The Clash, like you, you're, you're talking about you know, 10, 20 like, great pop songs in their catalog. Right. But it's, they're not playing it like it's pop music. Well, it's, it's just a, a good band. song. Yeah, it's just a punk but band so, that like, got taken into pop. I'm like, if, you, if you're going to... Play this sort of metallic sounding shit like, like it's pop music. Remember, Duran Duran was a pop band. Remember, Hall and Oates was a pop mm-hmm. band. Remember, mm-hmm. these are sophisticated songwriters who wrote sof- like amazing songs. I get when you go, come up with a melody that fits over those four chords, and it's the same melody that, that comes out every year, and like you know, kids eat it up. But like, dude, you're an artist, like. Your obligation should be to lead your audience into something new yeah. so they can discover something, not shit out the same thing that you ate last year. I don't fucking care. I get that. And I, th- I think a lot of that is fans just aren't educated to that. You know what I mean? Fans. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, that's why I say it's real. As an artist, what is your obligation? 
Well, I don't think those artists care necessarily. And I could both. I could True. go from pop music True. all no, the way no, to I'm, the art industry. I'm sure they don't care. Yeah, I'm saying. In there for the money I'm saying the when did clout. when did artists stop being artists and become competent craftsmen, mm -hmm. semi competent craftsmen, writing simplistic melodies? I mean, I feel like that's pop embarrassing. Music's taken a worse dive yeah. than, than heavy music. Oh well, yeah, there's so many people. Previous generations. Yeah. Pop music in the '80s was like super sophisticated, awesome, weird songwriting and chords. Yeah, there's nothing and weird really melodies. like out of left field in pop now music. Now it's just like it's just the same fucking chords. And no, the I mean same there's beats and the same there's melodies. A, there's a couple. There's a couple of artists that I really like, like contemporary artists that I really like at the pop level, but they are interesting. You know, they are pushing, mm -hmm. and I think that I think if they can do it, why can't everybody else? Like. It's that seemed to be. I don't think those people can. I think there's a reason why right. those people. So are you there. Sh you should, you're, you should be edged out of the the business. Yeah, you should be edged out of the industry based on the fact somebody, that your you know quality I mean? isn't high enough. They're making money you know? for a label. Or and if something. you're doing the if you're 2023 and you're doing the Motley Crue thing, remember what Motley Crue was. They were. I I've never really been a huge Crue fan, but like. Same. They look. They're like savagely loose on stage. Mm, it's they're a pretty bad at the US festival. <laughs> yeah, but in a way, I love it because I'm yeah, just it's like, wild. oh, you go it's see, roll, right? yeah. you go see the, you know, the bands with like three words in their title or four yeah. words in their title with you know makeup and outfits and everything. It's like that's the show. That Sorry, is the show. That's the show. That the show ain't so. the music. What, what like, would a band like Baroness ever incorporate a show? Like you know, like. I won't. I won't say like makeup or anything like that. But like, say you're split. you you know the spheres about production, of them. But you know what? This is this. Okay. So like, we going back to that class show. It's four players on stage. Yeah. With just like all the lights are on. But back much. then there wasn't anything like that I in know, competition. But That's that the problem. To me, maybe because I'm maybe. Oh, I don't know. That to me, they're so exciting to look at, and watch. And then somebody I saw maybe on Instagram somewhere like I just. Two, five seconds of that of that the new U two show. Oh yeah, the sphere. sphere. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Like, and it's like, and it's like, Bono's on a platform like this that's spinning around, and there's like a gigantic screen that video takes away behind him. From and I'm like, that sucks. Absolutely takes that away. That sucks. You know? That fucking sucks. I think if you are a performer, you should perform. Right. Yeah. And you should be engaging as a human, and we should be interesting enough to look at and listen to on stage, and that should be enough. Mm. It should be enough. Should be. Yeah, but I mean, those, some we, people would need that extra. Sure, you know, yeah, sure. But I just, I well, they need uh, they, they need it, but they need it. They need <laughs> I it to. Don't like it. They need it to hide a lack of energy. I get you. Yeah. They need it to, in, in some you know, in some ways, just sort of create that kind of theatric mystique. Mm -hmm. But real mystique is a much higher commodity to me. You know. Like the thing that really sort of puts you on edge or the thing that really moves you or connects with you. And I think, I straight up think it's happening in basements and like yeah. DIY clubs and small clubs right now because there's been this recent up, like upsurge of, and it's happening in hardcore of all places. You well, know? I think it's I think, really, I think it's really amazing. Oh, I, I agree. And I think a lot of that, and we were talking about TikTok prior to starting this up, <laughs> I honestly think a lot of that is that the young generation is finding like mosh content or any kind of like other hardcore, Something you know, exciting. metalcore band on those kind of reels and uh, reels and TikToks and all right. that stuff, and they're eating it up because obviously, you know, hardcore for, for example, the, the ninja fighting, hardcore dancing is like wild to the, someone who's never seen it before, and they're like, what the hell, you know? Because mosh pits to them, I guess, to the normal person would think like. You know, just running into each other and pushing each other yeah. like an old or like a circle pit, right? But now you see like the ninja fighters and like people are like whoa, you know, and they are interested in what's going on. And I think that's what really is bringing a lot more younger people into that like fold. Yeah, and that's I mean that's what it that's what it did for me when I was young. You know, when I was when I was a teenager, and you know, Seb, Seb and I are like slightly different ages, <coughs> but when I was a young I'm teenager, a like Fugazi was happening, and running I out, running out. Oh, that, was, that was me. I was I was there for that. Yeah, you were there for that. But I was like, I was that like was the kid movie. looking at like, what? Yeah. Sonic Youth, what? Nirvana, what? Minor Threat, what? Like, all the things that were really and highly was influential on me were on stage, but the band. Yeah. 
and it felt so fucking yeah, real. Yeah, and when you said energy before, so real. it doesn't necessarily mean like physical performance and showing. It's just like the energy that the bra- the band gives. I mean, yes, you yeah. all can stand there and do nothing as long as like the energy is still coming through and it resonates with the crowd. Right, be, 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 because I think a lot of performers in this day and age love to love Start to up. spit the. They love the platitude of like, oh, hey, you know, thank you, audience. You're the ones who brought us here. We're, we're grateful to you. But it seems disingenuous. And I, I've always believed that the only show that's a good, or the only performance that we do that's a good one is where the crowd outperforms us. Right. Like, and the proof is in the pudding, because we play some horribly messy sets sometimes that are the best sets we ever play, because the crowd's rad. Yeah. And we could play, like, as absolutely like as tight as possible but if the crowd's not feeling it then it's it's actually not a good show it's yeah. just you know and i think i th- i don't i don't think that's an old fashioned way of thinking about it i think you know th- the reason that live music is great is because it's there's unexpected things that yeah. happen it's not because it's gritted and yeah, you know you got of backing most tracks big shows are like that nowadays sure even in the heavy music yeah yeah but I, but, but what I'm saying, what I, I'm what serious. I'm, what I say, I know. It's apparently, a big topic. apparently, there's this big, this big controversy in the drumming world. A lot of heavy bands, the, some players are just doing the hands part, and the feet is pre-recorded. No oh. way. Yeah, I mean, we've heard oh, that. Yeah, we've heard that. It's like a big, thing. Triggers and stuff. Yeah. No, no, not triggers. Well, I mean, they do pre-record. also in recording. They, you, you I'm know, saying they it's just they just press play and they, yeah. they, they're doing, the, you know, the sticks. Yeah, you can't always like, you know, if a drummer has a key, uh, keyboard, a uh, laptop next to him, you always got to wonder what's going on, you know? Yeah. yeah, but I'm like, if you have a laptop laptop next to you, do something, am- like amaze me with it. Right. Don't just use it for a click track or whatever. Don't use it for a click track. Yeah, like ama- if you're going to bring that thing on stage, you better blow my mind, son. And on that, I think we should probably kill it because I think the bands are <laughs> starting outside. Yeah, a squirrel right is playing I'll, out I'll there. I'll turn my mic so that people can hear it. Yeah. You, <laughs> could, you could probably hear it already. But uh, John, Sebastian, thank you very much for your time yeah, today. Yeah, thank you. And that was great having you on there. Uh, Thanks for the one question at the beginning. The one question? Well, we just kind of ran away with that. No, no. That, this is an interview. You know what I'm saying? I like the way where – I like the podcast when it's – not on you know on track for anything it's just yeah. any and everything and i hate asking questions i don't like them to be like an interview cool. so i appreciate your your willingness to do that of course all right bye everybody